as my guest today. We're going to have him for about an hour. we got no script, no agenda, as usual. Just a conversation between a couple guys. That's all. Thanks for joining us. Share it if you like it. Don't if you don't. All right, and uh, the producer gets the music paused on time. Get the Zoom stuff over here so my peeps can see it. Georgie, what's going on, my brother? The usual, the, the usual. usual. <laughs> Keep on strucking. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, thank you for your time. I know, well, we just, we did this for a couple hours already this morning. Um, and as I, I posted on Facebook, I don't know if you've seen it yet, but... Uh, I described you as a, uh, a friend and a mentor and a leader in the com in many communities. So, George Stanwick, for those who don't know who you are, give us a little rundown on who the heck you are, where you came from, and how you got to this place right now. Take as much time as you need, as I said. <laughs> <laughs> Not just as long as it doesn't go over an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. I got all the time you need, but I want to keep you on time. And, uh, yeah, you know. no worries be close to my commitment. No, um, yeah, I'm uh, actually a Toronto boy, boy, born and raised. Oh, I didn't know and, that. Uh, See, I know I'm going to learn yeah. something already about you. First first thing out, I didn't know you're a T.O. guy. Okay. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I was born the same month, same year, uh, two weeks apart from each other or 10 days apart from each other from my wife uh, at Mount Sinai Hospital. We were both born by the same doctor <laughs> in the same hospital in the same year really <laughs> and she was born on may 13th i was born on may 24th she the, was registered on the day i was born how many years after birth did it take you to actually meet her for the first time i'm sure you did <laughs> high school high school, high school. Grade wow. nine. yeah wow. we lived in the same neighborhood you are but, not uh, we with were... your high school sweetheart dude yep wow yeah, it's, been, uh, it's 47 years now we've been together dude that's it's, that's something you don't hear a long time yeah. <laughs> All yeah, right. So, how and, long were you uh, in TO for? Uh, till 19. Well, there was a lull. I had 1982 to 83. I went to PEI for a year mm -hmm. and then came back. Uh, just couldn't seem to make it work at that time because Joanne's parents moved down to PEI from Toronto uh, back in 74. Mm hmm. So I loved it down there, and I wanted to eventually move down there just to see what it's like. And uh, when we uh, moved down the first time, it just I didn't plan it quite right. Things were just not happening. So uh, we waited till uh, actually it was 1978 to 79 because we came back in 78. That was the year we decided to tie the knot. Mm in 78 to 79 uh we were in toronto till 81 tried it again at pei still couldn't make it work came back uh, actually we came back not that we couldn't make it work joanne got her job with canada post and she had to go back to ontario to get it and she wanted to work there because she had two years waited for on a waiting list to be a letter carrier and uh i uh i was in the process in 80 three 82 83 of going to a um school for carpentry doing my pre-apprenticeship program okay. because i wanted to be a tradesman but i didn't know I, I initially i wanted to be an electrician but this came up during the summer months and they offered it where you could keep continuing to get paid ei and get your ticket, an equivalent to your uh, first year apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. So I I decided, well, I was on a waiting list. I couldn't get right on it. So about two weeks before the course started, they gave me a call and uh, said, do you still want it? And I go, yeah. So I wound up going into the carpentry and the that would have been in 1982, September. Uh, 82, yes, 82, 83 is when Joanne got the call from Canada Post mm -hmm. and I was finished school in May of 83. <clears throat> and uh, we were going to 
start our careers. We basically started them at the same time. So she started with Canada Post, and a couple of months later, I transferred over with uh, uh, my daughter because I stayed back with my daughter to finish school while she was already up in Toronto for two months. And, um, and uh, we wound up using my mom for babysitting for Jennifer. Jennifer was born in 1982. And uh, when we got back to Toronto, I was able to finally get into the union because I tried to get a trade ticket before when I was in Toronto, but I couldn't. You had to have someone that was in the trade in order to sponsor you. And I couldn't get anyone to sponsor me because I had no relatives that had trades. And so I said, well, I'll have to put that on the back burner so something happens. And that's what prompted me to move down to PEI. And then all of a sudden, lo and behold, they had a, a, a trade school at Holland College in PEI. And so that when that opportunity came, that's how I got my pre-apprenticeship. My pre-apprenticeship then qualified me to go right away to the union. I just went into the union. I said I, I got my one-year equivalent from the course. They had someone sponsor me in PEI. And because I was moving to Toronto, I just asked for a transfer, got the transfer to Toronto. And, and then both Joanne and I started our careers in Toronto in 1984, actually. It took off by the time we put our uh, probationary time and stuff. And, uh, and we're, we stayed in Toronto till 87, 87. She got her transferred back to PEI because we loved it in PEI. And it was no problem for me transferring back to the union there. Uh, I was just finishing up my apprenticeship uh, in Toronto and wrote my ticket in, in PEI and wound up getting my interprovincial Red Seal. So uh, I stayed in Toronto in PEI for 13 years. It was from 1987 to 2000 or 1999 tail end of 1999 to 2000 and during that time just worked at uh various jobs on on the island whether it was economy was good or bad uh then the bridge project started in 1994 i was on the bridge project for three years 94 to 97 and june of 97 was the year it uh, opened up Confederation Bridge. So I was on that project the whole time with short little layoffs during that time frame. But at the same token, just before the bridge project started, there was a lull in work because of a uh, recession that was happening at the time in PEI. So then what I did was uh, uh, I again looked at increasing my education. So I found a a course, a two year course for business management and sales management uh, to get my business administration diploma uh, at Holland College. So I was able to enroll and got a good 70% of my course finished before I started at Straight Crossing. And then the next two years, I was able with con conversation with the uh, instructor to finish up the course through my layoffs and, and time offs to write the exams, write the tests and get my tickets on both business management and sales management. So once I got that on, on, on board, uh, then while uh, that was during the same time I was at straight crossing, I wound up ele being elevated right up to uh, former superintendent looking after 50 men and six foremen and a general foreman at the bridge. So you might say that was the pinnacle of my career as a carpenter. And uh, uh, right after the bridge uh, was opened, uh, there was a lull with work. Uh, that year was 1997 in June when I was laid off from the bridge. We had no work in the summer, so it uh, just dried up. And that was the first summer I ever had off. So I had to look for extra work in one way or another and uh, wound up getting me back to Ontario in Kitchener doing non-union work, but doing contract jobs. Because then if I went on the union list, I would have been off the union list in PEI. So I was still trying to get work in PEI 
through the union, so I wouldn't be far away from the family long, but at the same time, you've got to pay your bills. <laughs> I wound up taking contract jobs uh, with non-union sector, being a supervisor for various jobs with James Wade Construction in, uh, in Kitchener-Waterloo, which took me all around the province a couple of times. My, my mom and my brothers and sisters uh, were living there, my dad as well. Uh, though mom and dad at that time were not living together, <laughs> dad would still bring the laundry over for mom to wash. <laughs> uh, they had a, a volatile situation with their life. They didn't want, they couldn't get along. <laughs> they stayed more than three days together. There was a fight that broke out all the time. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, uh, Greek heritage, there's a lot of passion in, in the Greek heritage and, uh, and vocals and, and, and passion and emotion definitely flare up if there's no control. I remember so, uh, uh, I was uh, with an Italian girl one time. I remember going to Christmas at her place and saying, man, is it ever loud at this table? Like, I know you got 20 people. At, it was like the Last Supper, the long, long collapsing table. But these yeah. people, you know, and I am... I'm Irish way back. There's hardly any culture in me at all, and I'm fascinated by it. I grew up with uh, a Colombian guy who was my best friend in high school. We were the baddest, well, not bad, but just, you know, into regular teenage stuff, partying and, and being crazy. Uh, but his family, dude, when you sat down at their table, you were their family. You got the best seat. You got the best cut of beef. You like... And, and I just like the Colombians. And then when I went to Catholic school in grade five, all my boys were Italian. And, yeah. you know, I used to say to my mom when I was a kid, you know, um, Vince got a gold chain for Easter. How come we don't get presents for Easter? Like they really celebrate everything, especially the religious yeah. holidays. But loud, the culture is just, you know, I don't know if the, uh, actually, I did go. The Greeks the, are no Greek, different. We're Greek just girls across as well. the pond. <laughs> And, and everyone always knows me and I, my uniqueness with my loud, booming voice. So, and, and I remember an uncle of mine saying he doesn't like me. And I said, why don't you like me? He says, because you're louder than me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what we love about you, George. We always know, I mean, I miss the, the crew at, uh, at the, the cafe at church when we do our men's group Thursday morning. Number one, I miss my hugs. Man, you're one of the <laughs> one of the best huggers I know, and I do not take hugs lightly. I consider myself a world champion Olympic gold medalist in hugging. And, um, dude, I remember coming to the front of the church there where you're uh, with the prayer group or whatever. For anyone that needs to talk to someone or whatever, I remember coming up to you, and I need that, and Boom! That hug, those things had last a long time. So I miss you boys, man. I miss connecting with you guys. Hopefully we're back at it soon. So yeah. Uh, anyway, so, yeah. so we're we're back to Niagara now. Um, yeah, but, we we just moved. Uh, what happened is uh, because work was uh, scarce. Uh, wife and I both agreed because she found it difficult getting the kids. So where we lived in PEI was dead center between Summerside and Charlottetown. The kids were going. Uh, closer to Charlottetown for high school, uh, two of the, the kids, my two daughters, and um, uh, Jonathan was still in uh, the public school system, which was just down the road. But whenever they had to be carted somewhere, it was a good half hour's drive for my wife. And with me being out in Kitchener doing work and trying, and over the next three years from 97 to 2000, uh, I basically only got about four or five months work at PEI and uh, the rest of it was all contracted out or on EI uh, for whatever length of time. And I, and I tried, like I had my own business because every place I go, I, even here in Niagara, I got GPS construction and renovations. So I always open up a business. But when the economy's bad, I remember being told when I was trying to get the work, a guy would tell me, George, I know you'd do a better job, but my family would kill me if I don't hire Uncle Bill <laughs> to do the work. So how do you compete with the uh, family tightness that yeah. they have there? It was pretty hard. Uh, I was always from away, even though I lived there for 13 years and my son was born there. 
he was considered from away. Is that uh, what they call it? You're, you're from away? I love how they, <laughs> there, there's so many things. Where are you to? Uh, oh, you're from yeah. away. <laughs> Where, yeah, where or, or they'd say, well, where's your wife from? And I said, well, my wife's family was born in PEI. My wife wasn't born in PEI, but her mom was. Mm -hmm. And she said, then they would say, well, you're a half Islander <laughs> because of being married to one. So anyway, regardless of the fact, it just didn't pan out financially or, or with uh, situations for presenting itself for doing other kinds of work. So back, we didn't want to go back to Toronto. We wanted to go back to Ontario, and we had family both in Kitchener, Waterloo, and St. Catharines. And St. Catharines won out because we were checking prices for houses, mortgages, um, taxes, and they were just slightly lower than they were at Kitchener, Waterloo. And we kind of liked the milder winters <laughs> mm -hmm. here than we did over in Kitchener, Waterloo because we already had a good bombardment of winter down in PEI. So yeah. you always, like winter is winter there. Mm -hmm. You can get storm state for four days without a problem. And skidoers would come and uh, help you if you needed something mm -hmm. from the store. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, then that got us to Niagara. I just transferred over both my wife and myself uh, with our occupations because of being federal for my wife with Canada Post it was just waiting for the transfer to uh, I think she got her transfer to Niagara Falls first before she got the one to St. Catharines and I got transfer or transferred right into the St. Catharines local anyway local 18 so I just finished off my career I'm a retired carpenter from the union now mm -hmm. just turning 66 so this year I've uh, been retired now for over five years, um, uh, but still have my personal business is still open, the GPS construction and renovations, and it's only for clientele that I had built up that still want me to do the work. But I, I told them, look, if you're in a hurry to do it, uh, get somebody else. But if uh, you're willing to wait for situations where my grandkids got to be looked after or uh, they got sick or whatever, and my family needs me, or there's something going on with I have to do something for the church. I do it, and they, they, they're okay with it, so that's how I keep a go with side jobs so over the retirement. So it, cool. it kind of made things a lot more comfortable that way, and, and both my wife and I are enjoying being in St. Catharines. Uh, there's so much more that I wish in one sense – looking in hindsight that I didn't check out Niagara Falls St. Catharines before I moved down to PEI. I think I would have been set a mm. lot uh, better at that point in time, but it was never a consideration, what? never even thought of it. It wasn't meant to be, bro. Nope, nope, nope. And even prior to me getting into a trade during 1974 to 78, I was with uh, General Motors plant in Scarborough, van plant at the time they converted the Frigidaire plant to a, a Scarborough van plant, the old 70 Chevs, mm -hmm. uh, Chevy vans. And I was on the line for three years there before I gave them my notice because I just couldn't take the factory work. I wanted a trade. I tried to get a trade there. They, they didn't want to sponsor you on a trade. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember the first job I got for only one year was at General Electric. I was a laborer or, or trades helper. Again, they didn't want to promote a trade because I had to know somebody. So mm -hmm. it just, it just, this is the direction that it went to. And, uh, and I'm so thankful. I love the carpentry work. I uh, just enjoy it. I still enjoy it even in my retirement years. Uh, just now families so <laughs> getting on top of me. Dad, can you do this? Dad, can you do that? <laughs> So get us up to speed so, then now. What do you what, what consumes your life now in uh, in Niagara? What well, are you now in? it's it's family uh, with the grandkids. Uh, mm -hmm. We got I got five grandkids right now. Uh, all three of my children are living in the area. All three of them are mated up, uh, mm -hmm. but only two of them have children. So I've got three grandkids by my one, eldest daughter Jennifer, and Julianne's got two. 
And Jonathan, well, he's still thinking about it. <laughs> With, so uh, I'll have to wait for that at this point in time. Uh, and and church. Uh, church has been something that uh, I've been focusing on uh, with my carpentry side jobs as well. Uh, but uh, through the years of, I've been basically following Jesus, if you want to say, since uh, 1981. Okay. That was the first year because my wife and I, before we had kids in 82, had a lull or a short separation for six months. And uh, we just didn't see eye to eye. There were some things that happened and, and uh, yeah, it, then all of a sudden I'm, I'm discovering I'm getting hit on by more women that are married than I was getting hit on by single women. So then I started wondering what the heck is all this about? Cause I'd, I'd been out of the dating regime for seven years at that point in time. And, uh, and it just, Put, put me through a loop. And I remember going down to the Daytona 500 in 1981 because it was between 1980 to 1981 that we had this short separation. And uh, February of 1981, I remember the traffic just bothering me like crazy and pulling into a parking lot that had a First City Bank on one side and a Lutheran church on the other side. I wasn't a church goer. I didn't care for church at the time. I was, I considered myself atheist, but looking back, I said I was more agnostic than I was atheist. Mm -hmm. I seemed to always believe that mathematics always work. The positive plus a positive always puts out a positive. And if you give out a negative, the negative comes back to equal a positive. Mm -hmm. So I had that kind of philosophy after I got a little ticked when I was around 12 years old. <laughs> with the way my parents tried to raise me in religion. Mm. And, uh, uh, but it took that period of time uh, to all of a sudden for God to make himself real. Cause I went into that church <laughs> and all I did was go in for a sleep in the back pews. There was nobody <laughs> there. The lights were out. It was air conditioned. I thought, Oh, catch shut eye. Cause the traffic was bothering me. And I remember my brother telling me that, that sometimes he ducks into church because they're empty. <laughs> he says, and they're air conditioned and they're quiet. So that came to my mind at the time. And I went and ducked in and I fell asleep in the back view, but the lights were out at the time. I didn't realize it was a Sunday morning because as I was waking up, the lights were on. There were about 15 people and more coming in. So the first reaction was I was going to bolt. And I just said, <laughs> Holy mackerel. And then because I was just getting off, out of sleep, I was comfortable. <laughs> and I just said, well, nobody knows me here. I said, yeah, see what this thing's all about. Well, the sermon was all about how a husband should treat his wife. <laughs> and this is during my wife and I separation. <laughs> and my mouth's dropping to the floor. And I'm listening to this. And I'm going, oh, my goodness. And I remember an old couple. They just all of a sudden thought I was a regular that was from another uh, church area that came for a visit. So they invited me for lunch. And I, I wound up telling them that, I'm sorry, I, I haven't stepped into a church for, <laughs> and they for were, I don't know how many years now. And they gave you I, a good I, working I over during lunch? Oh, yeah. Well, the wife the wife looked at me kind of funny, and they kind of, I guess they were thinking, what are they getting themselves into? But uh, I wound up spending five hours with that old couple uh, that day. We had lunch, went to his home. Uh, he talked to me about prophecies, prophecies that came true, prophecies that will come true. And, and it just caught my interest. And he told me, he says, it wasn't a coincidence that I got put in there and why I'm going through what I'm going through. You've got to listen to what God's saying to me. And I, I heard him, and he actually even went out to a cabbage patch he had and picked cabbage for a half hour with him and uh, got a box of cabbage. He worked with the uh, uh, Cape Canaveral. He was uh, one of the technicians in Cape Canaveral at, in Florida. And so I found that kind of fascinating. And so we were, we were talking at the time, but by the time he was ready to let me go, 
he drove me back to the parking lot to get my car because uh, we went in his vehicle when we went for lunch and stayed the day. And uh, he said, look, just listen to what he's saying to you. And I had questions galore like you wouldn't believe. Yeah, you're just, just, like, just so thirsty in the beginning when you come. Like, I mean, you, oh. you know my story. I grew up Catholic, always a believer. When I was old enough to hedge my bets, I figured, oh, geez, all I have to do is believe, and then I get into the gates. Well, I, I'm going to hedge my bets. I'm, I'm going to believe. Well, okay, I believe. And <laughs> we were kind of like, I think, maybe guys like you might call them cafeteria Catholics, or I don't know where I got that term, but, you know, we went on the religious holidays. That was it. Uh, I was in Catholic school, never much on faith, never, I don't consider myself religious even today, but, and, and Catholic church, like, near killed me. Like, it was so painful to sit through mass because it, I was bored and the repetition, and now I find it ceremonial and somehow more beautiful than I ever did. But even my grade eight graduation, you know, I'm I'm six foot two, 150 pounds, 160 pounds, a big, long, skinny kid, and I remember yeah. uh, standing with Emmanuel Legamino at the back of the church, and uh, we went to stand from being uh, from being now kneeling on on her knees and then i stood up and my eyes rolled back in my head and egg amino said to me fan what's your problem and he smacked my face and i went down like a ton of bricks i passed right i was already passing out he didn't know but he smacked yeah. me and asked me what was up and a crash in the back of the pew and they drag like literally i'm a big kid so it took a few of them they dragged me out into the front lawn of saint alfred's was my parish that i was going to saint alfred's school at the time and i came to with this massive headache and i didn't understand it didn't so i went through confirmation all of the stuff and then it wasn't until my mother asked me, of all people, she was never the religious one in our family. It was my father that wanted us to have a faith because his mother was like, uh, what do you call it, devout Catholic. Like she made the sign of the cross when she went by churches or graveyards or whatever. She was praying. She like I've got her prayer books. Yeah. She was, she was faithful, and um, not perfect, but very, very strong in faith. And she wanted us to have that. And uh, it wasn't until uh, Brooke Abrahams died, Derek and Sue's four-year-old girl. She wasn't supposed to even make it to four. It was a miracle she made it to four. I, th I believe that was her age. And I was at Remax at the time, and my mom had caught me in the hall, and she says, "You going to Derek? Are you going for Brooke's uh, memorial?" And I said, "Well, well you going?" She says, "Yeah, I'm going." She was the manager of the office, and Derek work for her right basically um and i go okay i'll go you driving sure so all, all i had to do was jump into her car it was simple and then when i walked into central Dar darren latham was the preacher at the time you know i'm a you know me i like the dials and lights and sliders and i looked at that soundboard and i looked at those big the video screen up there in the production booth i'm like what the padded seats, you know, um, like just nothing that I was used to. And then yeah. the ceremony was absolutely beautiful. Now, I've been to, I can't remember what my Dutch friend was. He was a Dutch reform or something like that. It was at Pleasant View, and he had a three-piece for his funeral. Hank Stram was his name. He was a, he was one of my, he was on my dart team, and he, he, he always teased the hell out of me, but I, th he re I think he liked me. You know, because he was always teasing me all the time. <laughs> and it was a beautiful, that was my first or first or second experience of like, I was just at a funeral and I think it was really beautiful. Like the truly a celebration of life. And then Derek and Sue got up and spoke, which like I spoke at my mother's funeral too. I don't remember a word I said. Um, and it was all business for me. I broke down when I got off stage, but these two held it together. It was their own daughter. They held it together. They've really celebrated their life. And so mom says, you know, you want to come with me to the grave, to the cemetery? I'm like, yeah, sure. And I was still kind of in the background. D 
Derek and I, you know, weren't of the same faith or, you know, I was kind of a young, crazy animal. And Derek was a married Christian man. And we used to get into, in the fax machine room, we used to get into the weirdest arguments, you know. That's a conversation for another time. But just the experience of, like, working through that. And then I waited till everyone had gone up and given them some love at the grave. And I went up and give them both a big hug and told them I loved them. And, and from then on, that place kept dripping on me. And then my mother used to sneak in there. And then she'd say, you want to come to church with me? I'm like, where are you going? I'm going to Central. Okay. She says, now I sit, I, I got this thing. I wait till the music has started and everyone's seated so, so I can sneak in without talking to anyone. And then we're out of there as soon as they're done. I don't want to shake hands. I don't want to talk to anyone. I remember one of her friends from school came up and said, Claudia is, hey, welcome. And he said, I hope you find what you're looking for. And God bless her. She's dead now. But she's like, oh, fuck off. <laughs> she said his name. Would you get, like, get out of here? I don't need anything. <laughs> so we were really weird about it. And now I sit in that church very often and remember the times that, and Claude's and I had there together. And now, you know, for a kid that was never religious, never had much of a faith, was always kind of there in the background, I find that it's on my tongue a lot more now because I'm either talking about my role in production or I'm talking about looking after the kids downstairs. You know, many guys, you know, it'll be Saturday night and my guys will go, you know, let's blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, nah, I gotta, I, I'm in bed by 10, 30, 11 o'clock on Saturday nights. I got church tomorrow. What do you mean church? So I'm on production, you know, I'm there at six, thir- seven o'clock in the morning. So I find myself talking about it a lot more now, but only because of my positive experience, you know, through production. So, but, you know, I- Well, it's I, a passion I, you have. Yeah, and then, you know, it was, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, Bill says, ah, well, you, you should probably just get baptized. I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I'm down with that. I don't know. You guys still kind of freak me out. He, I don't know if I'm ready. He says, Jimmy, you're ready. Just sign up and go. And then Mike Buley, my cousin and I, uh, got baptized on a good Friday. And um, I was a mess in the pew. I couldn't stop crying. I don't know what it was. I was like, first, I didn't want anyone to look at me on the screen because I've always been really private about my faith. But I know Mike was kind of like sitting beside me going, oh, sh- stop it, Jimmy. Like, what? Come on. Like, what are you I don't crying know about? You anymore. <laughs> you're, you're, my, you're my football fan. We drink beers and swear at each other all Sunday, every Sunday. And uh, I don't, I still don't know what that was all about. But uh, that place really made an impression on me and it's been really good for me. And then, uh, probably over a decade ago, K.R. Davidson, another mentor, friend of mine, uh, there was a men's group that started out Wednesday nights in room 222 upstairs. I yeah. remember. Uh, I started at that time, did too. Did you? Yeah, you were there, too? Okay. With the I, men's group. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know if you were one of the it's original been that guys. Long. Wow. And, yeah. um, you know, I remember I went out with a girl, um, not for a very long time, Um but I remember coming out of there on Wednesday nights and her telling me, here's what you should not do. Don't stop going to that group because you you are fire. Every Wednesday night you come out of there, you call me, you're like 10 feet off the ground and you're really wound up in a good way. And she said, that, like, don't, don't quit that thing. And so yeah. here I am. I missed the odd week um, for whatever reason, but uh, it's been, it's been a, it's been a nice journey. Uh, I've learned so much from the testimony from guys in the group and then I don't know over 10 years later I'm like you know I don't consider myself a leader in that group but I lead a discussion at the very least you know and uh, you know I'm sure there's you know some discussions I think deep down inside all of us we're all leaders in a sense but with like maybe not with large groups but with the people that were influential over it when you talk from the heart and, and you, you care about the person you're talking to out of the heart, you're a leader. I don't, you know, like that's, that's the simple definition of it. And, uh, uh, people have lost touch over the years. I mean, 
I've been supervisor on job sites. And one of the reasons why I took it is because God impressed upon me, look, you've been a job steward most of your career telling management how they should treat their men. It's time you show them how to treat your men. Mm. <laughs> and that's what prompted me to go into supervision at the time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and yeah, it's, it's just a matter of faith and belief in others and helping others to get into the groove of what they've been meant to do in their life or what they want to do in their life. And it's, it's just, I've been enjoying that part of it. I've been in a lot of mediator uh, positions where I had to mediate between extreme conflicts over the years. And I see the common thread is one side's refusing to li listen to the other side, and it could be from both. And all it takes is someone to say, okay, what's the minimum ground you're willing to take? What's the minimum ground you can we somehow compromise and just, yeah, I understand you're hurt. I understand this bothers you a lot. I'm, I'm not going to devaluate that situation. Same with management. I understand your stance. You don't have certain controls, but we got to come to meet a middle ground here or otherwise we're going to go through more expenses of going through arbitration. <laughs> so in many cases, I've been able to talk my way into a, a, a settlement prior to it going to court and it saves the company money, it saves the union money. And plus it saves a lot of heartaches with the guys. And that's what I find that is happening out there. I love applying, if you want to call it, I, I never called myself religious, but I had a belief. Mm -hmm. And my belief was treat others with respect and you'll be treated with respect. And if they don't treat you with respect, thank them. <laughs> because I remember, I remember going, as a job steward, there was a real... Uh, isolated situation that was uh, bizarre because a supervisor wound up putting uh, two laborers using a gun, a screw gun, to assemble something. And that's a no-no when you're in the trades because that's a, a carpenter's job to have the screw gun. Now, this supervisor was, uh, he, he's, uh, he was very adamantly uh, opposed to anyone telling him what to do. And I, I always got stuck with him as a job steward because I was the only one that could negotiate with him out of everyone else. Everyone lost their temper with him. So my men wanted to walk out through a wildcat strike. And all I did was go out to the guy and I said, look, Jill, I just want you to consider something. You get back to me. How about putting a carpenter and a laborer together to do that job so we minimize any aggravation? I didn't tell him to do it right away. I told, told him to think about it. I showed him where it was in the collective agreement and I walked away and I let him think about it. And then it was a matter of just 15, 20 minutes. He came back and he says, yeah, you're right. And, but if I took my stance and said, you better do it or the guys are walking out, he would have just dug his heels in and there would have been a major conflict, but he saw what I was trying to say. He did what I asked. And it unruffled the ruffled feathers that were about to explode. And that's, that's basically what we're, our job is, even as Christians. We're to unruffle ruffled feathers, because if we cause the ruffled feathers, then are we really acting as a Christian? That's what I question that's, my, my, that's the my definition. role all the time. I'm ruffling more feathers than I seem to be putting down these days. <laughs> Uh, and I'm, work, I'm working on it. I'm trying to find a way to lead with love, but it's not always easy. George, tell me a little bit about, like for me, grew up a believer, not really head first into it, never very much religious, never very much faithful, still not, you know, I'm not, you know, I always say, I'm not a great Christian. Um, so, but I kind of eased into it. You know, it was familiar already. I got a little taste of something I liked outside of my normal uh, church, and I found myself, you know, really enjoying leadership, the leadership of the church, and then my role in leadership, even if it's mentoring young kids on the video switch. But what, 
what switch was thrown for you? When did you go head first into it? And you know, I'm a little sensitive to get guys go, oh, I remember the day I got saved. Well, because I can't point, <laughs> you know, I hate that terminology saved because I don't, I don't think yeah. I'm saved yet. I don't remember a day where I went, oh, 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 yeah, I'm all better now type of thing. I, I went into the tank, got baptized as a, as an adult. You know, some people would say, you're already baptized as a child. What's your problem? I'm like, yeah, it wasn't my choice. I'm going to do it as a as Well, a so man. was I. Because yeah. Greek Orthodox bring up is uh, the same. I was brought up Greek Orthodox, and I was baptized as a child, too. And uh, because the Greek Orthodox isn't that much different with the uh, Catholics in, in a lot of their ceremonial right. and stuff. And, it, and that's all we did was go to Easter and Christmas because Dad was a hunter and a fisher. So he loved doing uh, hunting and fishing on weekends rather than going to church. Okay. And and that's the way he was. But uh, the biggest one for me at the time, because I wasn't looking to go to church when it happened. Right. All of a sudden, Jesus came to me and said, what are you doing with your life? Was it a crisis? Did he well, have... my wife and I were separated. All right. By me walking into that church... In a sense, I was saying help. So that was the but beginning of that day in church. I, when I didn't asleep. consciously know that, that that's what I was doing. I just, I was saying help me. Mm. And uh, I should have known better uh, about a, a year earlier. My wife and I had a, an argument because I was, I was in the insurance trade at that time. Five years, I was with the uh, life insurance. I was with Crown Life and I was... Uh, Million Dollar Roundtable, National Quality Award. I had an office downtown Toronto, right across from the new Massey Hall. I had a secretary. I had a Corvette. I had a Mercedes. I, you know, like, I like I had life by the tail. I, mm -hmm. it's, one of the agents said, you've got the tiger by the tail. I was 23 years old at the time, and uh, and they said, you're the young Turk, a uh, person who doesn't sell any need, a no-need seller. Because I had all my buddies weren't married. I was one of the rare ones that was married early. And so what I did was I put all my buddies into a situation with a wife, a kids, a mortgage, uh, planning for the future and saying, how much, uh, what do you want to do? How much do you want to pay for all this? Uh, what do you want to have provided? Then I'd show them how much it costs now, how much it's going to cost five years from now, and how much it's going to cost 10 years from now. <laughs> A lot of my buddies, when they were single, they bought the full package <laughs> because they were spending money like crazy. So that's why I got the nickname of the no need seller. They didn't have a need at the time, but I had many of them call me back and say, I'm so glad that I listened to you back then. And this was like, this was in an era that uh, I didn't know which way was going to go up. And my wife was scared of my ambition and my drive for success at the time and i was just going for it all guns blazing and that's why we separated because she was so fearful of it. and i say you need me one person just one person who hasn't helped anyone without money and out of her mouth just out of the blue she said jesus christ she stopped me dead in my tracks and i had my mouth down to the floor and i said name another one <laughs> <laughs> but she had me right there it's just like I never even thought of that at that time. And, and here I was so hell bent that you needed money to help people. Mm. And I was so far away from the truth at that time. Mm -hmm. And that was the preliminary of Jesus pulling me and what saying, was your okay, it's time to come home. What was your wife's faith like at that point? She had zero faith because her <laughs> mom was a, a forced Pentecostal which rebelled and my her father was a forced catholic who rebelled so they never baptized her or went to church or anything her grandmother was a pentecostal and her grandmother fed her information to the point as as a little girl she believed but because i was so strong against it she didn't even have a chance with me right. <laughs> like she was not going to convince me oh, that it was a it's God just like because... anyone else when 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 an, when somebody is struggling with their faith or a non-believer throws jesus up in your face they're like get out of here <laughs> oh i was like that and and being an alpha male I, at that point in time like you couldn't you know, i had so many uh jehovah witness everyone coming up to me and i said look 
I said, go find some other sucker. You're not going to hit hook me into this. How do you and feel when here, you get with those guys now? What's well, your... <laughs> well, now, now I've got the patience of Job with them. It's just like, holy mackerel. Like, like okay, you want to talk? I'll talk. But don't force your ideas onto me, and I won't force my ideas onto you, but I will share what I've discovered in scriptures, and that's all I want you to do is share what you've discovered in scriptures. And by doing so, we'll get closer to what the truth is. I said, as soon as an argument occurs, it tells me we're already down the wrong road, because we're not to dispute over words in scriptures. Mm. Yes, you do have a purpose. Each individual has a purpose that has to stay within that straight and narrow for that individual. But everyone's got to respect that. Even if it's against your belief, if you don't respect that, then how's the person ever going to listen to you? If you say, well, no, you can't do that that way. You got to do it this way. Well, all of a sudden it's your viewpoint that you're impressing upon them. And I found that God, what he did was he presented his way and the world's way. And he says, you choose. And basically, even if we're on the same page, we should always present our conversation as there's this way and this way. Hey, do what you want with it. I'm just sharing my life with you. Just use what you can and what you can't. Don't worry about it because I'm willing to listen to your life too. Hmm. And I want to find out what everyone else is doing because together we can make things happen. Individually, we don't. And that's the unfortunate thing. Obviously, look what's happening down in the States. I can't. I can't <laughs> and that's I another can't. conversation and a half. <laughs> Biden, Biden's speaking right now. I, I have to disengage from American politics. It's, 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 it's too, I, I get myself too worked up, too emotional by it all. Well, uh, that's it. But the thing is, everyone has a viewpoint. Even within my own family, we shared it before, but I'm not going to get into detail. I got one part of my family that, is a, a Trump advocate, another part of my family that's not. And, and like, holy mackerel, sparks were flying like crazy between them. And whenever I had the conversation, I calmed them down. I know so all they about that, understand. man. It's <laughs> strange. We, we're so divided now. And your opinion, your political opinion, your opinion on masks or COVID or whatever now is suddenly political to a point where, you know, I've lost a lot of friends. I have people that want nothing to do with me that I grew up with or family or whatever. They're just like, whatever, you're off the deep end. And yeah. why? Because my politics changed. I went from being, you know, far left to kind of center right. I'm certainly not far right, but uh, anything to the left of the far left now seems to be far right. But uh, anyway, what do you... Um, what are you focusing now on? What What's your passion? What What, what gets you up in the morning? And uh, what are you engaged uh, engaged in mostly now these days? Now it's uh, devotionals and uh, also I'm into three books, writing up three books. Oh. Uh, one of my books is uh, Jesus Helped Me Build the Confederation Bridge. Mm. And it's using my whole career how uh, – how my belief system and how my faith uh, elevated me to the positions that I got into and all the things, the supernatural things that were happening. So I'm sharing the construction of the bridge and sharing uh, spiritual principles. Mm -hmm. It's more a book for tradespersons to understand that our trades are a gift. It's a gift from him. And, even though we learn it from school and whatever, the passion that's in us is gifted from us to us by God. And I, w I just want to share how my passion in my trade, in how I was able to carry it out, how I influenced other people through my trade and through God's ways of doing things. Um, this is what the book's about. It's, it's sharing both the spiritual principles just through the basic construction of a huge bridge that was like an engineering marvel. Mm -hmm. We're creative beings. We've been created as creative beings. And we create all these things, all this technology, all these building structures and stuff. Yes, 
we don't have the fortitude to look at what the environmental impacts and stuff, but that's stuff we have to learn definitely. And I, that's why we have to consider all these things, but still look at the marvel of, of all the things that we've created in this, just this century alone has been unbelievable within this last 50 years. It's, it's just surpassed things that we were doing for the last 4,000 years, just in this last, 50 years and technology and and a way of engineering and and just the way the trades are are getting together i really believe that we've lost the ability of understanding that being a creative tradesman comes from god and let's thank him for that because he's the one that gives us the aha moments the creative moments because he's gifted us with those potentials. And so now I'm, I'm putting my thoughts and my career and all my experiences into writing both on how the spirit works with the physical. Mm. And, and that's where my passion lies. I've, I've been writing another book that was basically a testimony of my whole life, but uh, uh, he's told me to put that one on the back burners for now until the bridge one was done. And it's almost done. Like I'm within about two more chapters uh, of fine tuning and I got pictures and got to put into it. And uh, it's actually something he's impressed upon me to offer for free. It's not something I'll be charging for. So uh, it's trying to get people who are doubting why they do what they do or they have, they'd have no clue whether this was a trade they were meant to be. And it didn't, doesn't matter whether it's a carpenter, electrician, laborer, it's to the tradesmen that what you're doing, where you've been put, where your desire has got you has been gifted by the eternal. And there's things that you can learn where you're at that can open a, a, a purpose in your life that will be unbelievable, unexplainable, because everyone says to me, what are you on? Because they see me with so much laughter and so much joy. And I mean, I go through a lot of hardships and, and whatever the case may be too, but I count it all joy. And that's what it is in the scriptures. And I love having a good time, no matter what situation I'm in. And even this COVID, <laughs> How many times I've gone out just to make some uh, cashier smile. How you doing? Have a good day. I, I, I really appreciate what you're doing and, and be upbeat about it because, hey, life has got a way of getting all of us down. But mm. We have a choice. Either do we contribute to getting us down or do we contribute to elevating us mm. and lifting up the spirits and getting everyone into a positive frame of mind to discover a positive way to solve the dilemmas we're in. And I think that's how our creative juices flow when we want and we desire to want to create something that makes it work and makes it better for everybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, that's yeah. how the virus is going to get conquered. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. And uh, man, I appreciate your words and your wisdom and your advice. Um, what do you think it is about yourself? Like for me, when the wheels fall off the cart, and they do here and there, when you're broken and frustrated and angry and raging, you look for your friends. Now, I don't have a whole lot of Christian friends in my life, and so when I'm really struggling with something that I'm, you know, that feels like it's from the heart or I'm having a hard time with, I've got Bill Markham who's a great leader, and I consider him a friend of mine, that I can call and say, you know, he's a faith leader. Like, who who better to go to when you're having one of those days where you want to end it all? I'm not saying I'm suicidal. I'm just saying yeah. we've always had those days where you're like, oh, fuck this. I'm a Give up, Shit. please. I shouldn't have swore. I almost made it through a whole episode without dropping bad language. <laughs> um, and you've become that guy for me. You know, I've got Bill, uh, even KR, uh, busy. He usually gets back to me. He usually ends up leaving a voicemail. Mike Britton's a guy I speak to quite a lot. I'm not saying my yeah. boys, I don't talk to my boys, but, you know, um, I remember calling you in the summer 
when I was having a really, really emotional day. And um, I remember another time talking to Bill. Uh, you remember when we moved the uh, men's group to my office? Yeah. And then my yep. broker wasn't too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my broker's like, well, what are you doing in the, the office? Fiasco, what are you doing in the office at 7 with... o'clock in the morning on a Thursday? I go, it's just, you know, it's just a men's group. It was going to have anything to do with the church. I'm like, mm, it's a men's group. And I felt like Peter, like, forget, you know, I've got those guys in my life that were too toxic to, you know, support publicly. I think maybe I become one of those guys, you know, and I'm like, oh no, I denied three times. I thought, oh no, Peter, who could bail <laughs> on Jesus at the, the day before they put him on the cross? Uh, me. Uh, but how do you think you, what is it about you The people find um, that they can come to you, and I'm sure I'm not the only guy, but w what is it about your personality that puts you in a place where people feel comfortable coming to you and putting it all on the table and going, George, look it, I have no humility here. Uh, like, it's just it's like, I'm an open book. Like, give me some, give me some advice. Cause you've really been one of those guys for me. Uh, and, and just well, one, before you start with this whole thing with Bill, it's like at some point in the conversation, like I want to commit violence and I'm really amped up and I just get Bill the whole back story. For five minutes. God, I'll handle this my yeah, way. Yeah. Yeah. And then Bill says to me, you know, not in these words, he's way more tactful than I, but what I hear is Jimmy, who cares? Who cares? You're going to find another yeah. place, right? I get that you're angry. I'm not trying to diminish your feelings here, but really, really like who cares? Like, I mean, I know you care. I'm not saying who cares. I mean, like, what difference? That's what my mother would say. So anyways, when I get off the phone with you, you don't use that line on me, but I always feel better when I get off the phone. <laughs> well, it's it's the encouragement that I use more so, but basically I've been trained all my career because I've been a job steward most of my career in, mm -hmm. in carpentry, which is constant uh, aggravation from between management and workers. It's been part of my life where I've been trying to sort it out not to uh, to be siding with the uh, company more or to the men more, but to try to side towards what is right, the right thing to do. I'm not here to prove that you're right and you're right or you're wrong. I'm here to see what is best for both you and you. And when I, when I look at the circumstances, when God's gifted me over the periods of time to be able to discern what the situation, what the root of the problem is, I'm usually able to find a point of reference where they're willing to come down to or the opposition is willing to come down to. Because I'm not saying that they're wrong and they're right or they're wrong and they're right. I'm trying to get them to understand what is the right thing to do here that that's more important than who is right and that's basically what happens when you get frustrated over a situation where you want to give up what is causing that frustration do you want to c consider the situation as being the wrong thing that's happening to you mm -hmm. are you right and that's wrong mm -hmm. Or is that right and you're wrong? Or what is the right thing to do in the circumstance? And every time you use that analogy and you just put God in the equation, God's always right. And he may be allowing us to go through the situation to discover something about ourselves, which is more uplifting than downtrodding but we tend to focus on the downtrod a lot more. And so we got to get our focus off the downtrod and see where the benefits are. And if I can open the understanding and the eyes to the benefits, then everyone comes away with a contentment of, yeah, we both got something out of this mm -hmm. instead of you lost, you won. Mm. And that's the unfortunate thing is, is when you get one winner and one loser, it's not necessarily the right thing to do. Yeah, I just to follow up with that, I think for me, it's a feeling of being attacked, right? Yeah. And you're right. It's, yeah. it's ego judgment and pride from the standpoint that I'm in the right and you're wrong right now. And I, I mean, I don't use the word persecution that much, but that's 
in that specific moment of, you know, is it a church thing? I feel like, okay, <laughs> first, my resignation will be on your desk tomorrow. Second, see in human rights tribunal because I'm going to sue your yep. ass off because you can't discriminate against guys having a bit. Like, I pay for that room. <laughs> you, you take money out of every check to pay for your rent and blah, blah. That's my room. Now you're not, now you're going to tell me that it's only for real estate purposes. So I come away and like my back is up and I come out swinging. Like I'm, yeah. I'm like getting back. Like that's all that's consuming me. Revenge. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, George, I just want to keep you on time. We're already at an hour. Can you believe it goes yeah. that fast? Um, yeah, it just, just uh, it flies by. It's not like morning group. No, in closing, <laughs> we just let it go on. <laughs> and I'd like to pick up on this uh, a little bit more, maybe with a couple more guys on another time where we can go deeper into it. But just speak to me a little bit about uh, our men's group and what it's meant to you, and and why it might be all right for someone that you know is not convicted in faith to find a support group that's based in faith like i mean the, pretty much all the guys that go there are christians at some level all on different paths and stuff like that but talk to me and the people watching just a little bit about what it's meant to you and what might be there for someone that you know might listen to this and go yeah men's group whatever i don't need that <laughs> well what i find with men's group is i have a, a a truly strong belief system that the holy spirit that's in each and every one of us that believe and I'm not, not to neglect the fact that there are those that do not believe because the Holy spirit is with you, whether you care to admit it or not, the Holy spirit is either in you or with you. So you, you're getting benefits from both areas. And that's why I love hearing from people that are non-believers. I'm willing because they've got some prodding by the Holy spirit on the outside that they develop a wisdom because God's no respecter of persons. So he will give you a wisdom and it isn't just a blanket. Well, you got to be a believer to be in men's group. No, you don't. You just got to want to find truth and purpose for your life. Hmm. And you want a bunch of guys that are not going to condemn you or judge you hmm. when you're sharing your points of view as long as you have a respect for their points of view. Mm. And this is the beauty of, of why the faith-based men's group tends to be a lot more, um, a lot less condemning mm -hmm. to others and a lot more uh, long-suffering and patient I think to that's... even misunderstandings. I think a lot of people have a misunderstanding about Christians like they aren't tolerant you know they 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 don't condone homosexuality or they they hate sinners or all that kind of stuff it's, I think there's a misunderstanding of, amongst maybe casual believers that the, you know the faithful yes. are all just intolerant well it, it, unfortunately there are those that um, have not matured in the faith mm. enough to understand what respect because we're all made in the image God. And if we knock someone down, we're basically saying, God, you did, you did a crappy job on that person because he's mm -hmm. not in your image. Mm -hmm. And who are we to judge another person of where they're at and what they're struggling with? We got to respect them as a human being. Amen. And as a human being, when we respect them, then they start to see the human being in me and that I'm broken in, in areas just as they're broken. Mm -hmm. And I'm not here for condemnation, but I'm here to exercise possibilities of what the Christian faith brings, which is advocating more love than it does judgment. Unfortunately, too many people are using judgment. As I had said to one person earlier uh i think it was in the 21 days of prayer i i just uh, typed it out it was yesterday i just said uh there's two ways of uh telling truth there's truth with condemnation and judgment or there's telling truth with love mm. and i'm not talking about humanistic love i'm talking about agape love which is the godly love that even the greeks know that the word agape is a gifting from the eternal so when you're telling truth 
you're still telling truth, but you're putting yourself in the same boat as a person who's committed any sin because you're a sinner too. And that's coming out of love, telling truth through love rather than telling truth through condemnation and judgment. They both are truth, but one gets your back up because one is based on a human thought. The other one is based on God's love. And that makes a whole different conversation. And, and too many people, unfortunately, when arguments start, you realize that it's from a condemnation and judgment truth, not from a loving truth. And that's what we should all strive for. Thank you, my brother. Um, and for your time today, I don't know if uh, I, I had a little fantasy earlier of a guy going, Georgie, you going on with Jimmy? Be careful, dude. That guy's crazy. <laughs> make, sure, <laughs> make sure he doesn't make you look like an idiot there, bro. <laughs> uh, so hey, I appreciate one of the you. things that I used to always say when people are uh, <laughs> Because I, 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 like I'm always boisterous at job sites, and I love getting people laughing. So I sit, I'm a singer, and I love belting tunes and yeah. getting people to laugh. Okay. If you come out with the word, if you say stop, I'll go stop in the name <laughs> of love. And or if you say, if you say, okay, I'm not saying another word, and I'm going to be quiet for, and you just don't say anything for about a minute or two, then I'll go. Silence is golden, <laughs> golden. So I would have a song for something. It wouldn't matter what it was. And I'd get people laughing through that type of atmosphere at the workplace. And that's what it's all about. I don't like, man, you got to enjoy yourself in the space that you're at because we're only here for a short time before we're in eternity. And we're here to bring as many people over onto the good side to have a party. God loves parties. Don't ever get that wrong. He does love parties. You look in the Old Testament. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> I mean, God, he must love and that's another me. another conversation. <laughs> yeah, maybe. All right, just on the way out, how can people get a hold of you if they want to ring you up or where do they find you? They can find you on Facebook. Like the, I put your uh Yeah, I, I, I've got to get myself more on the social media aspect. I don't no. get myself too much in it, and I've been making it kind of like a new year's resolution that i gotta get out there no and no, you uh, don't. <laughs> it's probably better that's than the quickest way it just causes you more yeah. hate and rage man you look at the well, stuff and go, <laughs> that's what it's the like thing when is you're... is that you're you, you've prompted me just through casual conversation and yeah you're going to get the people that dislike or don't care for what you have to mm. say and and i'll i pray for them all the time i mm. do pray for them because they don't understand the point of... I pray that they stub and break their to... toe. That's what I break. <laughs> That's what I pray. <laughs> Come on, God, yeah. help me out no, here. No, 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 give no. Them a, give them a cold. You gotta, you, you, you gotta uh, allow God to do the work in that person. Because again, like God's working in everyone. I don't care who you are. Yeah. And it just takes probably quite a few years. Like it took took me from the time I told him where to go <laughs> when I was 12 years old. <laughs> oh, Yeah. That's another story I can tell you. And I, I hit under the bed when I told him where to go and I thought I was going to get hit by lightning. And when I did, and I come up back out and I told him to F off again. <laughs> I had a picture of him in my mom and dad's room. I got disciplined for something anyway. But yeah, until that time, till when he made himself real to me and say, you got to come back home. Uh, man, oh man, did I try a lot of stupid things and realized <laughs> what a what a mess I was making of my life. And I'm telling you, that's what's given me the joy now is staying on on track with what he's made me for. And that's with my family, with my wife, with my kids, my grandkids, with my boys, with church, with neighbors, with new people I meet. Hey, it's all about giving out joy. Because God's got a bigger shovel than I do. <laughs> I'll shovel it out and give people as much laughter and joy and happiness as I can because he's got a lot more to give to me than I got to give out. Here so, he is on Facebook. Facebook would be the quickest way I'm going to try to get myself back out there. <laughs> Your Facebook page is up right now so people can... S-T-A-N-W-Y-C-K, George Stanwick. 
look them up and uh thanks for joining us today i'm gonna end the broadcast keep, right, you, uh, keep you on for a second george so i can say goodbye but uh peace love right. hug your neighbor and rip that mask off because it's not working i'm out <laughs> okay we're not streaming anymore but we are still recording uh let's see here Zoom. there you are i kept you uh, 11 minutes late brother uh sorry about that my apologies to anybody that's all that's, right my apologies i didn't to know anyone. how long this was going to go anyway oh i i thought we were i thought well i wanted when you say two to three i want to i want to respect your time but i certainly could have kept kept you two hours no problem but uh um yeah. i want to make sure that i'm on time with you brother so thank you for your time bro um hey i'm not sure it was it was, it, it, it was good it was just like just shooting the breeze in the living room awesome <laughs> well that's what it's supposed to be all about <laughs> And that's what it's supposed to be like, yep. in the, you know, and that's what our conversation should be with everyone. Mm -hmm. That's why I don't believe in arguments of, of who is right and who is wrong. Mm -hmm. I'd rather, what is the right thing to do? Let's find our common ground areas mm -hmm. where we're in agreement because those are the areas we need to be edified and grow. The parts that we are arguing and debating, let's leave them alone and pray about them and find out when we need to work on them. And it won't be at that time because there's too much debate on it. And when there's a debate like that, you're not going to come up with a solution that's going to be uh, compatible for both. It'll be a win and lose situation. And that's why I stay away from that kind of debate mm -hmm. now. <laughs> well, I appreciate your time. I really didn't know what my end game was here or why I often go into these conversations with people people as much as a fan that i am i'm like what am i doing here what are we gonna like where are we going what's the what's the goal here and i i wasn't sure what it was You're doing a fine felt <laughs> yeah it's, it's just all about nothing um so i do appreciate your time and and uh man i love you man so thank you for your friendship it's been uh rewarding to be your friend no worries brother uh, i will talk to you later right. enjoy peace brother <laughs> Cheers. That is that. My buddy George Stanwick. And uh, you can find him here on Facebook if that's where you want to pick him up. Other words, otherwise, if you want to get a hold of him, get in touch with me and I'll put you in touch. Take it easy, everyone.